Hello, everyone. Uh, we're pleased that you could all uh, join us. Um, I'm Kevin Fitzsimmons, uh, co-founder and one of the judges for the F3 uh, initiative and our contest. And uh, we'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today for the emerging trends in uh, alternative feeds for shrimp. This is the sixth in our series of monthly F3 webinars that we're hosting on the latest advances in aquaculture feed ingredients to replace fish meal and fish oil. And why do we need these ingredients, these replacements? Well, as I think everybody here knows, wild caught fish are a declining resource. And without replacements, aquaculture would be severely bottlenecked and could not grow to feed a world of 9 billion uh, people. But replacements are just around the corner or already here. Uh, our seminars feature the most promising ingredients so that aquaculture can continue to grow sustainably. Our first webinars looked at different in alternative ingredients, uh, insects, single cell proteins, algae, soy products. And just as a reminder, recordings of these webinars are available at f3meeting.com at our website. Uh, now we're taking a look at trends in the use of uh, alternative ingredients and feeds for the biggest users of fish meal and fish oil, which are the salmonids, the shrimp, and other carnivorous uh, fish species. Our last webinar focused on feeds for salmonids, and today's webinar will focus on the use of alternative ingredients and feeds for shrimp. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to make a quick announcement that the new registration deadline for the F3 Challenge Carnivore Edition has been announced and participants may continue to register until September 15th of this year. And please check our website, f3challenge.org for updates. We have seven competitors so far and several are seeking uh, partners. So now is a good team to check in and see if you might want to join one of those uh, teams of contestants. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Ewan uh, McLean. He's an aquaculture consultant and one of the advisors for the F3 uh, feed research trials. Ewan has over 30 years of experience in aquaculture and fisheries and over 200 publications. He has contributed to the authoring of national and international guidelines on environmental monitoring for aquaculture and has co-organized several regional, national, and even international symposia. We're thankful to have Ewan on the F3 team and we look forward to his presentation on recent F3 trials as well as other research on shrimp feed. So Alex, please, let's bring on Ewan. This presentation will summarize a couple of studies in which we examined the impact of fish meal free diets on the growth performance of white leg shrimp. The studies that I'll describe after this slide are by no means unique. There have actually been hundreds of studies that have evaluated tens of alternative dietary proteins for specific white leg shrimp feeds and the honeycomb to the left provides a list of not all, but just some of the alternative proteins that have been evaluated, um, generally speaking, in laboratory environments. Comparatively few trials have evaluated complete replacement of fish meal, however. Fewer still have transferred experimental fi findings to an industrial setting. A trial that we completed last year which is noted in the reference to the left of the slide, examined various terrestrial proteins as substitutes for fish meal in blends for Pacific white leg shrimp feed. Five diets were formulated to contain fish meal as a positive control, poultry byproduct meal, fermented soybean meal, and a negative soy control, and a fish meal free diet. The Mr. Feed is a product that uses a fermentation 
of organic waste and byproduct system. A control commercial feed was used as well. Evaluation of all the feeds and essential amino acid profiles illustrated that most matched or exceeded the essential amino acid profiles of the fish meal, which is the yellow line in the diagram. Growth responses from the shrimp also indicated that the dietary essential amino acids were sufficient. SPF shrimp were held in a recirculating aquaculture system. The tanks had a 350 litre operational volume and 50 shrimp were delivered to each tank randomly. Tanks were then randomly assigned to one of the six diets and each tank was covered and equipped with an individual biofilter and aeration. Shrimp were fed four times daily to satiation for two months. After the eight week trial, no differences were recorded between groups for growth or survival. We are now in the middle of a farm-based trial to determine whether the fish-free feeds can compete under field conditions. Another trial I'd like to draw your attention to relates to an organic yeast-based protein uh, that replaced fish meal in diets for Pacific white shrimp. The trial employed an AHAB recirculating system. Five SPF shrimp were distributed into each aquarium and fed ad libitum for 42 days and with excess feed removal every 24 hours. Aquaria were randomly assigned to one of two groups, either a 35% crude protein ground shrimp ration or a yeast wall based protein in which the fish meal was replaced on a unit protein basis. There were no differences in water quality and at trial end, we found no significant differences between groups in terms of body mass gain, survival, or specific growth rate. Following on from the successful lab trials with our yeast-based diet, uh, we wanted to see whether or not it was possible to obtain similar results, similar performance from the shrimp uh, in a more commercial or industrialized setting. And so between 2004 and 2006, we undertook three trials at Permium C Organics in Imperial, Texas. The results of these studies are summarized in the reference noted to the left of the slide. Each trial used four 1.8 hectare ponds stocked with 180,000 PL per pond. The ponds also received organic fertilizer from a organically certified dairy farm at 51 kilograms per hectare twice a month. One pond was fed commercial feed while the other three received the yeast based feed at 18 kilograms per day. Of note was that temperature variations below normal led to trial extension on some occasions. There were no differences in growth or production between feeds over the three separate trials undertaken between 2004 and 2006. There were, however, differences between years because of temperature problems, especially during 2004. In total, together with other people's work, these trials demonstrate categorically that white leg shrimp can be produced using fish meal free feeds and under commercial conditions without any negative impact upon growth performance. Studies of the types described are not easy to undertake. They demand inputs from a broad range of dedicated individuals and organizations, some of who are celebrated on this slide. My thanks to them and to all of you for your time and interest. Thank you. Thank you, and we really appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Our next person up is Dr. Locke Tron, uh, who is the founder and director of Shrimp Vet Laboratory in Vietnam. 
Locke leads a team of more than 70 researchers in shrimp health management, focusing on genetics, breeding, seed production, diagnostics, and disease management, as well as farm techniques. Locke received his PhD in aquaculture pathology from the University of Arizona, where he was instrumental in identification of, EM, of EMS, early mortality syndrome, and the development of diagnostic tools used for on-farm management. Thanks for joining us today, Locke, and let's hear the latest on your work. Hello, this is Locke Tran, and today I will present my work on fish feed feed. And the topic is that fish feed feed or F3 fits nicely, nicely to super intensive farming in Vietnam. First, I want to mention that this is a very fast growing train in Vietnam that farmers are shifting from traditional pond, earthen pond to um, highly uh, efficient, uh, smaller footprint, uh, super intensive ponds with very high stock density and very nice equip and control. The density could be up to uh, 150 to 500 pieces per square meter and the, stock, and the productivity is up to 100 tons per hectare. Very promising. However, there's a lot of challenges that we are facing I think there's a couple strongest challenges, including pollution caused by nitrite accumulation. And this leads to muscle necrosis disease caused by Vibrio harvii, and this caused mass mortality. And other diseases like EMS, Appen, Bifysis disease, high production cost due to the cost of water exchange and high FCR. Here's a couple uh, important diseases in, in shrimp farming, including letter number A, white spot uh, syndrome virus is a viral disease. Uh, white feces disease, letter number B, is a bacterial disease cause a lot of economic losses. Letter number C is EMS, happen causing mass mortality at young stage, a bacterial disease. And EHB is a parasitic disease causing slow growth. We also face new disease that we haven't seen before. For example, muscle necrosis caused by Vibrio harvii. And the root cause of this disease per our investigation is due to high nitrite leading to immune suppression and uh, shrimp uh, innate uh, immunity and defense layer become compromised and become more susceptible to infection and then leading to mass mortality. We have done quite a few study uh, on different ingredients uh, for the F3 feed, including plant protein concentrate uh, products derived from ethanol production and so on. And we use uh, EMS challenge, a bacterial disease challenge as a model to, in, to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, different ingredients. Like in this trial, we could determine that 7.5% inclusion could really improve the survivability of shrimp in an EMS challenge. Similarly, we try with different other ingredients. And like over here, you see Diet number A showed the best survival rate compared with the positive control. And again, another trial showing that if we can find a good inclusion rate of um, novel ingredients, sometimes it's really improved the shrimp health, shrimp immune system, and that is why they tolerate to disease a lot better. And a couple of our trial has been published and we already have uh, some uh, formulation uh, and proof the concept that it can uh, be utilized as a commercial feed uh, in uh, a lab model. But uh, we move forward to run uh, 
full-scale pond trial in Vietnam with four a thousand um, cubic meter circular pond. This is a two by two uh, design with a commercial feed in Vietnam versus an F3, a fish free feed. Uh, stock in density at 200 feet per square meter and starting uh, from two gram juveniles. And the result after seven weeks of feeding was very interesting with a clear improved growth rate of the F3 feed with an ADG of 0 0.45 compared with the commercial feed at 0 0.36. And we have just weighed the shrimp yesterday and the two pound of F3 reached 22 something grams um, and the uh, commercial feed reached about 18 or something grams uh, per animal. And so it's a clear improvement of about 23% in terms of growth. And when we check for uh, the shrimp uh, flesh quality, it seems that the shrimp fed with F3 feed is more fattened. And uh, that is why you may see in this photo, the shrimp in the F3 seems to have full flesh underneath the carapace and uh, the shelf. However, the shrimp in the commercial feed seems to be a little bit uh, loose. And uh, I got a bad news that uh, one pond from the commercial feed uh, with the high mortality and we have to terminate just uh, today due to high nitrite. This also implies that the pond fed with F3, the water is much cleaner. I don't present the data of nitrite here, but uh, so far as our, in our record, that the F3 feed uh, will confer much cleaner water. So the take home message uh, from our uh, trial is that there have been several ingredients have been discovered that can improve shrimp digestibility, availability of micronutrient in feed, and the tolerance and stress uh, to stress and diseases. Uh, shrimp need nutrient to grow. They just don't care about the source of nutrient. And with better formulation, I strongly believe that it can improve growth, survival rate, productivity, profit, and very importantly, it may reduce pollution. So I think fish free feed is absolutely realistic and it can adapt nicely to super intensive farming. And a lot of industry people in Vietnam are really looking forward to receiving F free feed in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you, Locke. And uh, I also want to put in a good word for uh, one of those 70 researchers, who is my lovely wife, who's helping with some of that research. So uh, thank you again, Locke. Uh, another reminder that if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them during the Q&A session. Uh, so moving on, we actually have two speakers from P.T. Suritani Pamuka, STP, Aquaculture Division of JAPFA Group in uh, Indonesia. And they're gonna be tag teaming uh, on our next presentation. And so uh, we have Ardi Budiono, who's the president and director, and Dr. Erwin Suwendi, who's the head of nutrition and feed technology. Artie has been with the JAPFA group for over 20 years and has led the aquaculture division of JAPFA since 2017. Erwin currently leads the nutrition formulation and quality control as well as research development for STP. STP operates five feed mills across Indonesia and has an annual production capacity of 400,000 tons per year. We're excited to hear about STP Jaffa's uh, experience with alternative ingredients. So let's hear it from them, Alex, please. The sudden blaze of sunlight will bring life to the earth. 
Nature is showing us how to respect our beautiful planet. Lakes and oceans are the major reservoir of protein for today. They will continue to support us all the important sources, virtually accessible from all corners of the world. But today, unfortunately, the nature isn't hunting, yes, hunting to survive, for the sake of humanity, to provide food for all mankind. Then just imagine this, humans are harvesting all the sources of the lakes and oceans more than they ever produce. So what's left for the future generation? This is why STP comes to provide a relevant and more sustainable aquaculture practice. Suritani Pamuka is the aquaculture division of the Jaffa Group that has been dedicated for half a century producing super quality protein food locally and globally. In doing so, we run the state-of-the-art facility to keep our products always being the top quality across Indonesia. Our aqua feed mills develop the highest feed formula through advanced technology to produce an optimal performance for the feed under its diverse aquaculture conditions. Our shrimp, fish hatchery and breeding facilities produce high-quality starter species. Our facilities is supported by high-end equipment that operates a responsible, sustainable operation and implements biosecurity that propose continuity to ensure that our products are disease and virus-free. As in symbol of hope for the nation, Aquaculture by STP is built for the now of protein food production. We are here by producing affordable, yet super quality shrimp and fish processed food. We focus on strong integrated value chain by improving the health and safety of seafood consumption, especially for the future generation. Our scientific proven approach to aquaculture is a relentless technological innovation to provide total solution through our highest quality product and services for our customers. STP monitors and studies aquaculture ecosystem and explores the interaction between the environment fisheries and aquaculture. But we can never achieve any of that without the support of our people. With our three values, purposeful, responsible, relentless we intrinsically become the symbol of hope for people to excel their career. We create value for our stakeholders because we know that success is better when it's shared. We become our best selves when we are part of something larger than ourselves, when we are building a sustainable future for our customers, our communities, for our people, for our planet, this place, we call home. First of all, I'd like to, to say thank you to uh, F3 for giving STP a chance to be able to join and participate in this virtual event. I believe this is the second time STP participate in F3 event and we are very much delighted to be part of it again. My name is Adi Budiono. I am the President Director of STP. It's an aquaculture division of Java Group. And I'm here today with my colleagues Erin Swendy, who will be joining later to present our initiative and journey towards uh, sustainable feed products. STP is an aquaculture division of Java, where our main business focus in aqua feed, hatchery, grow out farming, and also seafood processing. Since 1987, we have been producing a wide range of aquafit products. 
and with a strong R&D and animal health team, we continue to develop our feed products to ensure that it can perform in various different water conditions and also to make our customer farming more optimal. For that, in the last four years, STP runs a business transformation that allows all our business pillars execute various innovation and transformation to achieve our vision in becoming a total solution company for our stakeholders. Our vision in becoming total solution company is by implementing our mission to support customers so that they are able to achieve performance and profitable business. And this mission is done by embracing three values, purposeful, responsible, relentless in our day-to-day -day operation. In innovation and development, we are supported by our animal health team, R&D team, and aquaculture technology development team. And together we focus in continuous improvement towards a sustainable and responsible farming. We believe that success is better if we reach together with our stakeholders. For that future generation, we partner with two international universities well known for its aquaculture studies and research. For small farmers, we help them implement sustainable farming. And for community, we help the fish farmer implement 4.0 fish farming. Aligned with Java vision, growing towards mutual prosperity, we hope that through this collaboration initiatives, our stakeholders will reach success and mutual prosperity together with STP today and also for the future. Thank you again, uh, F3, for giving STP this great opportunity. And from here, my colleagues Erin Swendy will continue the presentation on the sustainable stream feed. Thank you, Adi. Hello, everyone. I am Erwin, working as the head of nutrition and feed tech STP, aquaculture division of Java Group. Uh, thank you for having us in this wonderful opportunity to share what STP has been progressing towards sustainable stream feed in the region. So let's get started. For the last three years, STP has been successfully introduced low fish meal stream feed in the market under the brand of SGH. Through consistent in-house research and technical nutrition know-how, we've been able to reduce a significant amount of fish meal in our stream feed. As a result, the fish in fish out ratio of SGH shows a marked decrease to 0.41, meaning that for a kilo of white fish use, 2.4 kilo of farm stream is produced. This pie chart shows uh, annual sales of STP stream feed in percentage over the last four years. As can be seen, the low fish meal diet, SGH, deemed by the dark blue color, exhibit a substantial growth since 2017 and keep dominating the sales volume by 84% in 2020. Uh, this indicates that our customers are highly satisfied with our feed in terms of productivity performance, yield quality, as well as STP services. Java Aquaculture Research Stations, or JARS, that how we name it as our core nutrition research center. We've been working with local and international universities, as well as stakeholders, to perform feeding trials over a different scheme from indoor to pilot scale until applied into commercial farm. We conduct a wide range of studies, such as assessment of ingredient digestibility for stream, growth and nutrient utilizations, as well as product positioning of current feed in the market. And that brings us to the end. I would like to thank you for your time and attention today, and we look forward to having a fruitful discussion afterward. Thank you. Thank you, Artie and, and Erwin, both of you. And uh, uh, so our next uh, speaker is Jennifer Ko, who is the Chief of Technology Development and the Sustainability Officer for Grow Best Group. Jennifer has been with Grow Best since 1992 and has held numerous positions supporting the animal health and business management groups, as well as the ingredient development team. Grow Best is committed to developing innovative products to support safe and sustainable aquaculture, and they operate a cutting edge R&D program. 
Their animal feed production is 800,000 metric tons per year. And we look forward to hearing their take on alternative ingredients in shrimp feeds. So please, Jennifer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jennifer, the Chief Technology Development and the Sustainability Officer at Growbest. Many thanks to the organizer for the opportunity to share our views on the development of a sustainable feed products. Growbest was established in 1974. Our core business is aquatic animal nutrition and animal health. More than 45 years, we provide aquatic feed products to the aquaculture industry. The philosophy for grow best research and the development is to learn from the nature and respect nature. We devoted to supply feed products to support safe and sustainable aquaculture. Over decades, aquatic feed products have largely depended on marine resources and soil productions. Both fishery products and soil products provide quality protein and oil from human consumption as well. The world production has increased rapidly in recent years. So the demands for food have increased dramatically. With the challenges of limited land for cultivation and the overfishing issues in the ocean, the need to find alternatives for more sustainable feed products has become essential for a sustainable aquaculture industry. There is a lot of research being done on alternatives that include traditional ingredients and novel ingredients. We now know the production of novel ingredients has a lower carbon footprint and is more environmentally friendly. This has attracted lots of attention. However, the challenges are mostly on the availability in large volumes and at an affordable cost. We have recently seen the production technology for some novel ingredients has improved. So more potential novel ingredients are being commercialized and are available in the market. Most of them are good alternatives to being included in aquatic feed products. Robest organized a novel ingredient development team in 2019 to search for and evaluate using alternatives without compromising animal health or feed cost. Our aim is to look for marine protein alternatives, oil alternatives, and plant protein alternatives to achieve our goal for more sustainable feed products. We have conducted a lot of animal trials to evaluate the performance of different novel ingredients on shrimp and fish. The indicators we consider when using alternatives include nutritional value, digestibility, palatability, amino acid balance, fatty acid balance, minerals, as well as animal growth, survival rate, and animal health. From the findings we have, some novel ingredients do perform well. More trials needed to be done to further evaluate the efficiency of potential novel ingredients. Our team 
will continue the research both in the laboratory and in the field. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so our next speaker is Alexandra Vie. Uh, Alexander is the shrimp nutritionist for Goldcoin Group. Alexander has experience working across sectors with government, private organizations, and researchers on animal nutrition and sustainable solutions for aquaculture. Now with Goldcoin, he's working to formulate efficient and sustainable shrimp feeds. Goldcoin is a pioneer in the manufacturing of scientifically based animal feed in Asia and produces 4.2 million metric tons of feed annually, including 60,000 metric tons of shrimp feed. So thank you for joining us, Alexander. We're eager to hear more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the F3 Shrimp webinar session for the Pilmico and Goldcoin Group, an Abotis company. I will introduce the group a little bit. So the group is mainly present in Asia uh, with a 30 facility over nine countries. The overall feed group production is around 4.2 million uh, metric tons. This includes uh, livestock, pet, duck and also aquafits. The shrimp specific volume is around 60,000 metric tons a year. This shrimp feed is made in order to adapt to each customer needs because this is the company core value to produce something uh, according to customer specific requirement. Every country has different requirements, so it's our duty to adapt. In order to adapt, we have produced uh, two very specific types of feeds. One is a non-GMO and or non-soybean meal containing diets. So this one is to support farmer who have certified their production to non-GMO or selling them to a label, uh, green label or red label to Europe that requires such uh, informations. The second one is also some country have uh, negative feedbacks or have fear towards soybean meal. So we answer their fear or their um, questions, and we are able to produce for them a non-soybean meal made diet. The second big feed is the bioflock and semi-flock special feeds. The idea is to improve the water quality while still providing a fast-growing diet for the shrimps. And all this is made in accordance with the BAP certified uh, the BAP certification that we all our feel, feed meal have. To go further than the customer needs, we also are engaged in sustainability. This comprises into three pillars. The first one is promoting local economy. So we are a local uh, factory. We are local feed meal producers. So we also promote local raw material. And we try to reduce the import of imported raw material if the quality or if a similar product is fine locally, we will use preferably the locally sourced. The second pillar is the priority to green energy, like solar, green gas, and others. Uh, this is from our supplier. So we will preferably choose raw material from suppliers that are already engaged in such pillars. We also propose to our customer uh, some solutions to partner for solar panel or green gases. And for our production process, we, as much as we can, we are engaged into using solar and green gases to produce our feed. The third pillar would be the use of alternative raw material that are more environmental friendly, like the seaweeds. Uh, why seaweeds? Because they are naturally grow on the sea out of the ammonia and phosphor pollutions of the oceans, and they will transform it into available protein for the shrimps or for other types of animals. The insects are towards the fish meal replacement and the processed animal protein uh, are preferred because they already come from uh, already, they are wastes from the animal industry. So rather than 
uh, burning those waste, if they can have a second life cycle, then it would be better for the overall environment. All this comes with some challenge, especially when it's come to the customer point of view uh, in terms of availability and also the um, perceptions. Perception wise, the main issue for the processed animal protein is the mad cow disease that leads to the strict uh, restriction on the use of uh, PAP in animal feeds, especially in Europe, where the, the sellers are very reticent into uh, selling product, animal or meat product that are fed processed animal protein. There is a lot to do to improve this buyer perspective. The other issue would be with the insect protein, which still have a low availability and a high price compared to fish meal. And aside from that, the import permit in most countries is quite uh, restrictive and quite long and not yet established, meaning that to get those protein is actually not a simple thing. So thanks for joining this session. I will be pleased to discuss more and answer your question regarding the Pilmico Gold Coin Group. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Uh, our next speaker is Robbins McIntosh, who is the Executive Vice President for CP Foods. Robbins has been involved in international shrimp farming and technology development since 1978. He joined CP Foods in 2001 and was tasked with revitalizing their shrimp culture through environmentally conscious technologies. CP Foods is the largest producer of shrimp feed in the world, with greater than 800,000 tons of annual production. On behalf of CP Foods, Robbins is now helping launch Homegrown Shrimp USA, which is currently operating a hatchery to provide fast-growing host larvae to the USA and Europe, and will soon begin harvesting fresh shrimp for the market. So let's please hear from Robbins. Good afternoon. Let me thank the F3 group for inviting Homegrown Shrimp to present our ideas on sustainable shrimp farming in the United States. So Homegrown Shrimp is a subsidiary of Jerome Polk Pond Food, CPF in, in Thailand. And our whole idea was to try to show a concept that was more sustainable than previous concepts, as well as a concept that can grow shrimp anywhere, anytime. So shrimp can be grown in the United States, Europe, or other cold weather uh, locations. A little bit about CPF. CPF is the largest producer of shrimp feed in the world with greater than 800,000 tons of annual production. We're headquartered in Bangkok, Thailand. We have feed mills in most Asian countries. We produce feeds for both Pineus vinami, Pineus monodon, also the freshwater prawn, uh, Macrobrachium rosenbergi. Uh, and our aquatic diets contain only marine byproduct meal and at levels of less than 12% of the diet. The company operates a very active R&D uh, program, which I'm showing here our first level of testing different ingredients uh, relative to performance. They then go to a second stage and a third stage. Uh, today, most of our work is, is on identifying alternative protein sources and how to balance those such that we can optimize our shrimp performance, as well as alternative oils, algal oils, other vegetable oils. Now, homegrown shrimp was to develop a sustainable shrimp culture concept that can be done anywhere in the world at any time and produce shrimp that would be close to markets. So fresh shrimp would be possible. Uh, that means it's developed in a non-coastal environment. So we're not impacting coastal environments. It's a total recycle and reuse of water. So the water that is made up is used over and over again, year after year. And there's high land use efficiency, meaning we can produce a very large amount of shrimp on a very small footprint. All shrimp wastes are captured and then put into a, into a form that does not you know, uh, have a negative impact on the environmental uh, or the environment. And there's no chemical use. These are healthy shrimp and that's the key to success for homegrown will be to maintain healthy shrimp. 
Now the farm is located, this initial farm is located in a place called Indian Town, Florida. It's conveniently located between four urban hubs, Orlando, Tampa, West Palm Beach, Miami, all with airports so that we can then ship fresh shrimp throughout the continental United States. Now the farm is currently under construction. We have an operating hatchery that is producing high quality post larvae and sells to both Europe and the United States today. Uh, by November, we should have our first farm unit in production and hopefully our first production comes out in January of 2021. There's, there will be 20 number, 20 tanks, 100 ton size. Now 100 ton size is so that we can harvest about 500 kilos in the initial phase, which should be marketable fresh. We should not have to uh, freeze that. So the idea is every day of the week, every month of the year, we will have fresh shrimp uh, in creating that fresh shrimp market. The buildings of course are insulated to maintain optimal uh, temperatures of 30 degrees, which is absolutely essential for a fast turn time. Uh, the, there'll be as much automation as we can put into the op operation to minimize human error, as well as minimize uh, the amount of labor that is required to operate the farm. Our production targets are five kilos per meter cube. This is not your normal RAS system with lots of exterior filtration. Most of our filtration is what I call in the tank. So it's, it's a bacterial in the tank uh, process. And then we basically take the sludge out and we process that out separately. Uh, we're planning on 90 day cycles. That is from harvest to harvest. So essentially uh, the stocking would be, stocking to harvest would probably be about 75, 80 days. And then you have 10 days to clean up and turn the tank around. Again, one of the important features will be zero waste and zero discharge water to the environment. So the, the solid waste or the slurries will be dehydrated such that that waste can then be properly disposed of in a way uh, that does not impact the environment. Now, we recognize that feed is a very important part of the sustainable story. And so we're developing a special feed for homegrown that will have zero marine meal, zero animal protein, and minimize agriculture land products such as soybean. Uh, we want to use only vegetable oils and algal oils. We'll have special binders that will be specially for tanks so that you don't create a lot of slurry. Uh, you basically keep the waste together, which makes them easier to remove and easier to process. And certainly there will no, be no special chemical additives or antibiotics in, in the system. Now in conjunction to the feed, we're also developing a special shrimp to utilize that feed. And we've had that program going since 2013. And on the right, I, on the right, I show the results of that improvement and how you can use genetic selection to improve shrimp lines you know, for use of vegetable diets. So in 2013, this top blue line is our normal commercial line we call turbo on our normal commercial feed. This blue line is basically at this point, this is turbo. And then we start selecting it for all vegetable protein. And you can see we can close the gap. And right now the performance of the vegetable diet is very close to the performance of turbo on a diet that has uh, marine meals. So in conclusion, Homegrown is going to be only fresh. It's going to be all natural fish, uh, shrimp. Uh, we've had one harvest uh, last, last summer. We, we did a trial just to see what the shrimp and what the reception of the market would be. Uh, we had very good reception to this idea of all natural, no antibiotics, no chemical, and no ocean. So we are not impacting oceans with the production of the shrimp. And again, just to thank you. Here shows a picture of some of the, what we call our celebrity chefs that came out. Uh, and we had some, a day of testing and looking at, around at the, at the homegrown concept. And again, from the, from the chef, sustainable chef community, uh, they, they really appreciate the work that's being done at Homegrown Shrimp. And thank you. All right, several great presentations there. Um, now I'd like to ask our panelists to turn on their videos and 
uh, briefly introduce themselves before we begin the Q&A session. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ardi Budiono uh, from JAPFA Group from STP is not able to uh, join us tonight for the Q&A, but we're thankful that uh, Irwin will be here. Uh, so uh, while we're letting everybody uh, turn on their videos, um, for the audience, uh, don't forget to type your questions into the Q&A box uh, so that we can address them during the session. Okay, uh, Robbins, you came on first, so why don't we uh, have you introduce yourself? I think you already introduced me, Kevin. Okay, you want to say anything else? <laughs> no, you did a good job. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, Jennifer, you want to say a few things just to introduce yourself quickly? Well, I uh, just want to say hi to everyone. Thank hello. you. Ewan. Hi, uh, yeah, hello everybody. Good evening, it's, or good morning. It's two o'clock in the morning here. Uh, I'm Ewan you. McLean, and um, I, I'm uh, basically uh, semi-retired, I guess. Um, but I've been involved in aquaculture for 30 years in different, different ways and, and means in terms of training and, and so on. So I look forward to having some questions maybe uh, that I can answer. That's great, okay. Alexander, we didn't get to see your face before, so we appreciate you uh, meeting you now. Okay, so here is my face. Thanks for inviting me for this uh, very nice seminar. Um, thanks. All right, and Erwin, good to see you again. Yeah, hi Kevin. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, yeah, thank you for having us in this uh, wonderful opportunity to share what we have been uh, doing. Yeah, looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so let me. Uh, Okay, so one of the questions that we've got, has anyone used microalgae as a feed supplement for protein and therapeutics? Uh, as a matter of fact, I kind of remember a couple people, but uh, I, I know Robbins, you've done a little of that. You wanna talk about that first? Uh, I have used uh, microalgae. I'm not sure I would ever call it a supplement uh, for anything. I mean, it's... Uh, Certainly, if you want uh, omega-3s, it's one of the few places you can get natural omega-3s. Um, it, the, it is the place that we go for the omega-3 outside of marine meal. But uh, I don't think I would ever call it a, a therapeutic per se, other than the necessity for omega-3 in the diet. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so here, here's a question for Locke. Can F3 be used in fish feed? Will it have the same effect um, in terms of meat quality? Uh, first, uh, we tried a taste test with the shrimp and the taste was really good. So there's no complaint. And uh, the fact is that uh, the, the shrimp uh, fed with the F3 diet uh, seems to be a little bit sweeter and more tender. So uh, I don't think there might be an issue with the uh, uh, fish flesh quality, I assume so, because uh, shrimp is highly carnivorous. Okay, let me pass out over to Ewan as well because he's been involved a little bit with some of the uh other trials that F3 folks have done? Yeah, we've uh, undertaken a, a few, few uh, trials with different species. Um, the, the most recent was the largemouth bass trial. Um, we got very fine results there. Uh, really good um, responses from um, a, a, a basic test, for taste test trial. Um, good growth, uh, no problems with survival. Um, very competitive. And uh, if you look at the, the cost breakdown, uh, the F3 formulations, which are open formulations and available, I think, on the F3 website, 
um, the F3 diet really, really does perform exceptionally well, and especially from an economics point of view, because a lot of the ingredients are a lot less expensive than, than fish meal. So uh, the bottom, bottom line there, the answer to the question is absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's, it's well to point out that you know, the, these fish were, were grown through a, more or less a whole production cycle. So we're, we're really excited by the results we've got. And that there are other, other pieces of research with Pompano and um, I think there's um, uh, some stuff they've done in Hawaii with um, Campeche, which has also provided really good results. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Erwin, we've got a, a comment uh, question here. Um, uh, STP provides a lot of support to shrimp farmers. What are they saying about alternative ingredients? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, technical support is part of our uh, uh, pillars to, to, uh, to support the, you know, the performance and profitable business. So alternative ingredient is actually one of our direction that uh, we are trying to, you know, uh, reduce the marine ingredients in our uh, formulation. So as long as, uh, you know, the farmers can get the, you know, the performance and, you know, stream help, then uh, that's, that's the way, that's the way we can, uh, we should go. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, we've got a question for you. Uh, what are the sustainability pillars of your company and what is your take on sustainable shrimp feeds? Mm. Well, um, Group has established uh, a sustainability platform, uh, which includes uh, um, many di directions, um, di dimensions. Um, for example, like uh, um, this, uh, the responsible sourcing, uh, supply chain, and also the human rights. Um, as to um, the sustainable product, that would be one major um, uh, area uh, on our platform. And um, our, our efforts um, to provide more sustainable feed products um, is to develop um, a fish-free and also a soil-free uh, feed in the future. So now um, our team uh, is um, exploring and also evaluating um, all the ingredients available uh, in the market or still in the pilot production. So in the past uh, two or three years, we have done lots of trials. And um, up to now, I can say that we have um, got um, good findings. Uh, it is uh, possible to replace 100% uh, fish meal uh, in shrimp feed and also in marine fish feed. This is the finding up to now. And uh, I think the, the most challenging uh, area is to replace soy products. So uh, this would be uh, <laughs> uh, my um, comments. Did I answer your question? I, I think you did. <laughs> I hope the uh, person who uh, submitted it uh, uh, got it. So, okay, uh, Alexander, with regard to including alternative ingredients in shrimp feeds, is Goldcoin interested in this more for supply chain security or due to factors like pressure from farmers or cost or disease? Uh, yes, of course, we, we are farmer oriented or customer oriented producers. So we understand them and we try to support them as much as we can. Uh, on the side of, for example, I mentioned about the BioFlock. So BioFlock or SemiFlock are a technology that is developing in some countries. So we, we try to adjust our formula to make the best, like to have the, um, the best support we can have from the feed for the, the environment in the water and as well as for the shrimp while maximizing the profit of the farmer. When it comes for disease, my experience is there is a lot of uh, product that have claims to improve disease or to, to cure, but the main issue is the lab condition and the farm condition are somehow very different. 
and some might work in one farm but might not work in the other farm so in this uh, health side i would be very cautious as saying that uh, we can 100% provide a solution to the customer okay great thank you um robins we have another question about uh, your new operation uh about the shrimp waste and is uh after you've dried it is this shrimp waste uh, reused uh the water recycled uh uh or is it just disposed of the solid waste i think you're still on mute I said we have a we have an advantage because the state of Florida allows us to dispose of nothing. So all the water must be totally recycled. And in, because it's all artificial, we're not near the coast. Uh, we really have to reuse it for years and years and years to amortize it like a capital cost. Huh. The solid waste, uh, because of the intensity of the operation, we get quite a bit of solid waste, molts, etc. And so once we dehydrate that. Uh, it will be easily removed, and hopefully we can find a use in terms of uh, organic mulch or something like that down the road. Uh, but basically, we are required to recycle and dispose of everything in an environmentally satisfactory method. So you're able to keep the salinity down in that product? Basically, the salinity will be there, but again, it would basically easily leach out uh, wherever it is. So when I've tried this in Belize, uh, basically it grows great citrus, bananas, uh, all kinds of things after a, after a rainfall. And because of the high, the high precipitation in Florida, they don't really worry about that because it easily gets diluted out. Uh, what they don't let you do is, to, is discharge the saline water itself. Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, um, this uh, is, is just a general one to uh, everybody on the panel. Um, and so the question is, what are the most in promising insect species which can be used as alternative shrimp feed ingredient? Uh, so what do you all think is the most promising insect meal to use? I think we can cover that question. Yeah, please. Marie. Yeah, to me, I think the black sodium fly would be uh, one of the promising ingredients to replace fish meal uh, uh, because it's due to the uh, quite similar uh, nutritional profile to fish meal. And also, black sodium fly is a uh, true flies, uh, diptera. Uh, the, the question that now we are uh, face, facing is actually the economy of scale and availability. Since like, you know, like us, when we are operating a huge, uh, you know, big amount of the production, then the quantity is a, is an issue nowadays for the uh, black sodium fry. Right. Okay, Thank good. You. Sure. Anybody want to champion any other insect meal? Uh, well, uh, we have tested uh, many species of uh, insect uh, meal. And uh, we found out that uh, black soldier and the mealworm uh, probably would uh, um, work well. But on top of that, I, I would like to emphasize that actually, um, I think all the species could be potential uh, ingredients. Uh, it depends on the quality uh, uh, and uh, also the uh, production technology during uh, uh, the production. Uh, that uh, that would be uh, uh, our key concerns. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Ewan, we've got one for you here. Uh, have you seen any benefits of F3 feeds with shrimp immunity studies? Well, the, the study we did um, together with Locke Trans, so uh, Locke has covered this. This was an F3 trial that... Uh, was collaborative, and uh, I think he's covered that in his, his talk very well. Um, but there, there, there were no real negative effects at all that we were able to measure. Uh, this is something um, that, that does concern me, though, because when you look at you know different 
alternate proteins in diets, especially with fish, uh, probably also with shrimp, you do get these reports of negative effects upon the gut and uh, ability of the animal to respond to um, uh, challenge. But again, with, with the trial undertaken uh, in, in Locke's lab, um, we, we got really good results with the F3 diet. Uh, with the animals more able to to respond to challenge than uh, the uh, fish meal based diet so um, I, I think it is a concern but it's it's not with the f3 diet so far uh, we need to look at it a little bit more detail um, but but that that is one concern that i have about alternate proteins um, when the, the soybean meal and and salmon for example were a good example of um, bad news really um, but, uh, but then the combination of you know immunostimulants and, and uh, alternate proteins is something that we need to look at uh, in a more quantitative way I think in the future whether it be for shrimp or, or for fish or any other aquatic organism uh-huh okay um, um, so so let me let me expand upon that there's another question for Locke can the potential health or immune effects of alternative ingredients balance out cost implications to make some alternative feeds more or ingredients more economical? Excuse me? Yeah, so the question is kind of building on that. Uh, can the potential immune effects of alternative ingredients balance out cost implications to make some uh, alternative ingredients more economical. Yes, true. And uh, we've been working on uh, evaluating um, individual in ingredients uh, of the F3 uh, formula. And there's a lot of health benefits of uh, those ingredients. So it's an added value into the, the, the food. Okay, good. All right, and then we've got, um, Another question for Robbins. Uh, what kind of vegetable oil do you use in the CP shrimp feed? And then kind of along with that, do you use any fermented soybean or other fermented raw materials uh, to replace some of the marine raw material? Okay, my response is relative to the diet, the experimental diets that I've been developing which I were actually used to develop the, uh, what I call the vegetable shrimp stocks. And so the oils in that are basically a combination of, of soy and rape oil. Uh, and the proteins are really soy, corn, gluten, wheat, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of pea protein. But, uh, but that's not a commercial diet. That's basically was a target diet I put together eight years ago, just so I could develop a shrimp stock that would concentrate on digesting vegetables and converting uh, low, uh, low uh, uh, chain fatty acids to higher chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, there's been considerable amount of selective selection that can be do done along those. So again, as, it, as I showed in that graph, the, the vegetable strain will perform almost as well as my normal strain on a vegetable diet that's on a fish meal or has a fish protein base. Uh, type of diet. So there is selection to be done. And again, what I used was to create basically that selection pressure for that over the years. Uh, what CP is doing, again, is most of their research is on alternative proteins from the insects to the methanogenic bacteria to uh, alternative vegetable proteins, everything. But that's actually the, the uh, majority of all of our dietary research is for alternative feed ingredients today. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Alexander, um, what does uh, your work with, with Goldcoin uh, looking at nutrient digestibility with some of these alternative proteins uh, that you guys are looking at? Uh, we know that's a, a big concern uh, and just curious of what you guys are looking at and what the impact on nutrient digestibility is. Um, we, we are all talking here about uh, sustainable ingredient, uh, but it seems like just a uh, insect meal or the algae oil or anything, it's actually more expensive than uh, the normal raw material. 
Uh, so developing a fully sustainable or a uh, fish, uh, shrimp, uh, shrimp, uh, shrimp, fish meal free diet or fish oil diet is already possible. But the issue is the cost. So at the moment, the market is not ready to accept uh, or may, not yet maybe for the price of uh, completely animal free, uh, marine animal free diets. But the, the, the system and the, the template already exists. So if we want to provide a, a non-fish meal, this is possible. But the cost we need to supplement to maintain the digestibility, the amino acid requirement that we lack in our current fish meal free diet, then this will add on the cost. So we do already know that fish meal free diet are available. We do know the side back on the digestibility, but to compensate the cost is sometimes not relevant for the end customer. Okay. And, and so here's kind of a follow on question that just popped up. Um, is your fish free, fish meal free, feed commercially available in China? Alexander? Uh, we, we don't have a fish meal free diet commercially available. We produce, for example, a soybean meal free diet or GMO free diet on demand for some customer, but a fish meal free diet, no customer has been asking for it so far. Okay, and Jennifer, does grow best? actually have a commercial F3 diet yet for sale? Uh, not yet. Uh, okay. it's, it is still uh, developing. So we don't uh, have any uh, fish-free uh, diet in, on the market yet for, 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 for shrimp and for marine fish. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was the case. And Erwin, uh, same situation, basically? Yeah, same situation, basically, Kevin. Uh, Sometimes we end up with a higher uh, cost of the formulations when we formulate with, you know, uh, uh, zero fish meals. So, but we are actually, uh, you know, looking for, you know, uh, alternative sustainable ingredients as, uh, you know, like uh, insect meals, you know, things like aquaculture, aquaculture or fisheries by product to, you know, to completely replace the, the fish meal. That's, I think the more, uh, feasible at the moment that you know for our commercial uh, operation yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay and and robbins i think you already answered that but just to confirm your your base cp is basically the same situation yeah that's that's correct basically I, again i think when we talk about this it's as much about educating consumers the farmers as, as anything else today i think if you took a farmer a all vegetable diet and they took one smell of it you're probably not going to make a sale. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's very true. Okay. Um, and so, uh, da, 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 da. Kevin, if I yes, may add something um, to to go on with the uh, Robin answers, the consumer also would be quite. Uh, not so happy to know that he pay more expensive shrimp that is a uh, fed vegetarian. I don't think in the head of the consumer, like the end consumer, a vegetarian shrimp should be more expensive than uh, a fish meal fed shrimp. So there is also a lot to do in the um, end consumer point of view and toward the sustainable ingredient, the use of a uh, byproduct fish meal, for example, uh, it's as sustainable as using other byproducts because it's already coming from a, it's, it's an existing waste that is transformed into a product. So the, I think the key for sustainability, rather than focusing on 100% plant diet, uh, plant-based diet, would be more on a, a various or diversity in the raw material. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, again, I think in terms of what I would be doing with an all vegetable diet, it would be for a niche market for a few consumers that really wanted all vegetarian, but it's not for the main market. The main market has got to be from diets that are competitive and yet are sustainable. So it's using byproducts and other relative ingredients uh, to make the, the lowest cost diet that is sustainable, uh, but not just with a definition, it's got to be all vegetable. 
Yeah. And, and just so people understand, um, the, as far as F3 is concerned, we recognize that too, that uh, the rendered product from processing waste uh, is, is uh, much more likely to be sustainable in the long run. And uh, we're, we're, we're happy to see that used. But for our contest purposes, there's no way for us to determine whether that fish meal is coming from wild caught fish or rendered product from processing byproduct. And so uh, we, we've, we've been forced to just say, okay, as far as our contests are concerned, we can't differentiate any of those. So we're just saying, you know, no, no marine protein period, because there's no way we could, we could separate that out at, at this point. At some time in the future, maybe we could with, with uh, uh, better uh, uh, DNA fingerprint type, type work. Uh, but uh, our, our main goal, as I'm sure everybody knows, is to uh, uh, really address the forage fish problem because that, that's the critical uh, ecological problem. It's an economic problem. Uh, it's a human welfare issue in many countries. Uh, so uh, we're, we're happy to see the uh, byproduct and especially of farmed fish uh, continue to, to grow. Uh, Kevin, I think that's also why I think breeding has got to be an important part of this, because I think through breeding, we can actually bring down the vegetable costs. Uh, right now, a wild, wild shrimp does not digest as efficiently as one that you select for it. So mm -hmm. we can actually drive down the cost of using all vegetables, both oil and meals, uh, through a selective breeding program. And that's kind of what, that's the angle I've been tra trying to take for the last eight years, is to create a shrimp that can consume a vegetable diet more efficiently and therefore bring the cost of that diet down. I mean, I've, I've, I've used all vegetable diets since 1998 in Belize. I fed upon nothing but wheat grain. So I pelleted wheat grain, 12% protein. I got an 80% survival at 15 tons per hectare. It grew very slow, but it's been no doubt that you can grow shrimp on all vegetables. It's just the efficiency at which you grow them. Well, and I think that's another excellent point, Robin, is that, that uh, we're, we're just a few generations removed from, from wild shrimp. Uh, and, you know, the domestication process is, is ongoing. And uh, without even doing any fancy uh, genetic uh, engineering GMO work, just plain selective breeding can get us a long way to more domesticated shrimp that are going to uh, do much better on these these diets with with a bit of uh, a few generations of selection. So I think that's an excellent point. Um, okay, uh, Ewan, here's another question for you. Uh, you're an academic, but you've also worked with the industry and government agencies. Given your broad experience, where do you see bottlenecks or challenges for alternative ingredients? I'm going to go back to the, the disease issue uh, and making sure that the health of the animal is not compromised by any ingredient that we use, you know, and, and um, <laughs> the, 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 the blends of proteins we're using um, seem to be getting better and better and better. I mean, I, I was thinking about the, the trout uh, breeding program, whether they're breeding trout at a more able to accept um, you know, vegetable-based diets. Uh, goes back to the shrimp, and I think I've done that also with Atlantic salmon, but um, the, the disease and health issues are in shrimp. But from my point of view, uh, the big bottlenecks, uh, when we start using you know, dietary ingredients without taking the, the health and welfare of the animal uh, into account. Um, that, that may be, I mean, I, I was interested to hear um, um, Robbins's take on the, the, uh, the niche markets for, uh, you know, all green animals. I mean, I think it depends where you are in the world. I mean, the Californians tend to be uh, into the organic thing. And all you have to do is look at organic 
organic farming is actually the fastest growing food production system in the world. It's not aquaculture. Everybody says it's aquaculture. It's actually organic farming. Maybe organic aquaculture is, is the fastest growing uh, food production system right now. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I just think it's the, the overall health and welfare of the animal. You have a healthy animal, it's going to perform well. Uh, and and the, the diet is everything because it's gut health. It's, you know, all health, basically. So I'd like to see more work uh, on, on different immuno, immuno stimulants, different immunoprotectants. You know, you've got the, you know, you know, your probiotics, your symbiotics, your prebiotics, your postbiotics, and all, all this kind of thing. But they have to be affordable. And, and you know, it's like insect, everybody's going on about insect proteins, but uh, at, at the, the F3 uh, deal with insect protein, I think somebody said $5,000 a ton. Are you kidding me? So I, you know, I, I like to, I, I was thinking about an insect I'd like to look at as an alternative protein, it'd be termites. I mean, a, a female termite lays a million eggs a day or something. And, and so, so that's one, one insect we really should be looking at very seriously. Um, but, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's the oil issue. Uh, the, 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 the algal oil is very interesting to me. Um, I think uh, that, that's a bottleneck is, is, is how do we replace the fish oil that we need? It's the fish oil that's more, more the, the pressure thing right now, I think, than the fish meal. Yeah. I think we can get rid of fish meal. And, and we've proven that, you know, I, I mean, it's, we've, we've done that um, since really 2000, before 2000, 1995. I mean, uh, Cowship was doing work on trout and there's now commercial trout production uh, being sold in, into French supermarkets, which are, are fish, fish free, you know? So it, it is possible it's not a niche market and they're doing really quite well, I understand. Um, but, but I think that my, my, the key bottleneck for me is the health of the animal because a healthy animal is a higher performing animal and therefore production wise, it's more efficient and more profitable. And, and then it'll stabilize the sector and, and, and uh, hopefully help it grow. So, so Robbins would, uh, you was kind of mentioning, would you actually call your system uh, organic? And, and there's another question here kind of related to that. Would you call it a bioflock system? <laughs> uh, bioflock was the worst term I think I ever invented. <laughs> <laughs> it's an advanced bioflock system, but people that see my bioflock today say you don't have bioflock. Because okay. I don't believe in a lot of junk in the pond. I mean, all of that has to be removed as sludge. So I yeah. use a nitrifying bioflock. So for me, bioflock is about internal recycling of, of, of processing water. It's not about nutrition. Uh, so basically, I use bioflock to, to recycle nitrogen using nitrifiers, which is thin and not thick like a heterotrophic. So I don't yeah. do heterotrophic. I do nitrifying bioflock uh, because I find internal... A uh, RAS is more is lower cost than an external RAS filter, okay. right? So I do internal RAS with nitrifiers inside the tank instead of outside the tank. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, uh, would you call your product uh, an organic? Could you market it as organic? I don't like I don't like to market anything as organic. I like to market with everything as healthy. You know, I mean, I don't want antibiotics. I don't want chemicals. It will be organic, but I just hate the term because it, it implies a higher price than I want to charge a consumer for. I want to think that everything that we sell is healthy for a consumer and we don't differentiate. <laughs> so it would be organic, even though there's no, I think, regulations in the United States that say it's organic, uh, because right. I don't plan on doing anything that would be non-organic but i would hate to label it organic i rather i'd rather create the term healthy <laughs> yeah good consumer healthy consumer friendly uh you know consumer enjoyable uh <laughs> versus versus organic uh one other thing i'd like to mention though kevin in terms of bottlenecks what about governments now i'm not up to date on this but it used to be like in vietnam they regulated a minimum amount of fish meal 
they regulate a minimum amount of protein. They regu they, there's regulations that sometimes handcuff you as to what you can and cannot do from a practical point of view. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that for Vietnam or some of the other countries. So let me pass that over to uh, uh, the rest of the panel uh, who might know the answer to some of that. Locke, you want to talk about Vietnam? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, there's a lot of regulation. And uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Robbins that uh, it could be uh, impractical. Jennifer, has, has GrowBest run into this anywhere? Well, um, I have no answer about the uh, fish meal inclusion rate limitation, but uh, I, um, I remember that in some countries there are uh, protein content uh, limitation. For ah, example, okay. uh, we need to meet uh, uh, the protein uh, percentage at uh, minimum level. So sometimes uh, I think it is, uh, it is a bottleneck for the feed um, industry to improve. Uh, perhaps those, uh, those I would call uh, a bottleneck. And uh, what uh, Robbins mentioned, if there is a uh, limitation about the uh, fish meal inclusion rates, then definitely the, um, it will be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alexander, have you guys run into that with gold coin anywhere? Uh, not directly with the protein content, uh, except from what has already been said, but more on the use of uh, animal protein. So some of our end buyer, they have the, the request not to be fed with uh, animal byproducts. So this is because it mostly for selling in Europe, even though P, uh, protein animal byproducts are allowed to use in animal feed, uh, there is still the strong perception from the consumer and from the buyer that their animal products shall not be fed with animal byproduct protein. So it's, a, it's another type of bottleneck, but uh, this is the bottleneck that has to face the insect meal, for example, because it's considered as a protein animal byproduct. So again, education. Yeah, well, and I know there are several countries uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and, and Middle East uh, that, that are very, uh, regulate any pork byproducts in there um, and, as, as an ingredient, pork byproducts. Erwin, is that the situation in, in Indonesia as well, as far as uh, pork byproducts in, in feeds from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, definitely the porcelain byproduct or porcelain is yeah. not, uh, definitely cannot be used in Indonesia since we are the, you know, one of the largest Muslim country in the world. Sure. The government, uh, our government only uh, specify like the minimum uh, crude protein, okay. uh, uh, 28%, but uh, the government doesn't, uh, you know, look, I mean, uh, put into details on, you know, how, uh, what sort of ingredient that we cannot use, but it's just only from the, from the protein perspective. So minimum 28%. Uh, will be used as the uh, uh, sim fit in Indonesia. Yeah, well, and I know in the U.S. we have some pretty strict uh, regulations on new ingredients and having to have uh, a lot of background information available before uh, new ingredients can be approved in animal feeds. And as strange as it may sound, there are a lot of ingredients that are approved for human consumption well before they are for animal feed consumption. Uh, so uh, sometimes we run into that. And, and I expect that's probably the case in Europe and, and maybe some places in Asia as well. To, to, um, to animal byproducts that are used in, in, in feeds for shrimp uh, that are destined for the Muslim market, have to use halal meats or, or halal uh, byproducts. Right. Uh, it's more complicated than that. Uh, if you follow the halal, the true halal uh, way, then it's pulled. Uh, animal byproduct are by definition haram. 
So if you sell okay. to Middle East, you cannot use any of the blood meal or the animal byproduct. Like really? Yeah. So even if it's derived from a halal product, Fish. a halal beef, for example, you no, can't no. use any rendered product from, from that beef? No. No. Really? Oh, interesting. The Quran uh, says that, uh, okay, no, I will not say anything on that. Uh, but just uh, if the regulation there is no terrestrial animal byproduct, I want to avoid any conflict. So I do not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I, know, I know in Saudi, so, sorry. they had um, some tilapia farms that were using um, treated sewage. And that, that was fine. You know, they had, a, a, I guess, a conference of imams to discuss it. But that was interesting. But, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. I actually heard about that. And, and it had to do with uh, strictures about not wasting uh, water and other natural resources. And so that was the interpretation that, that I was told as to why that was allowed in, in certain cases. Uh, because otherwise, it would be a waste of water not to use it productively like that. Hmm. So, but, but you're right, it, it took a, a, a group of religious leaders to really look at it very seriously uh, yeah. and, and interpret the understanding. Yeah. So, okay, we've got one, one final question here um, for the, the panel that uh, I'll share with you. What is the prospect of yeast proteins in alternative protein feeds and can it be considered as a functional feed protein? Can I, can I jump in here? Because the reason I put uh, uh, on my slides presentation uh, work that was done in 2004 was, um, hey, because it doesn't, doesn't get any, any uh, uh, disclosure there, it seems, but we used a yeast protein um, and we got really good results. We, we used the same protein with cobia, uh, with yellow perch um, uh, and a couple of other species with really fantastic results. Uh, but the problem with it, e even in terms of um, salinity challenges, salinity tolerance, uh, immunostimulation, we looked at the EM, EM work on the gut and all that kind of thing. Uh, the problem was it was $700 a ton, <laughs> $7,000 a ton. I think oh. since 2004, it's come down now. Yeah. Um, but, but we, we had nothing but you know, really good results with, with that, that particular product. But at the time, you know, fish meal was, I, I think, nine or $900 or $1,000 a ton. So we, we were well out. But we, what we were interested in demonstrating was uh, an organic production system where you could use the yeast um, with, with a carnivore, which was the cobia. And we, we had sort of totally fish meal free. Uh, and, and fish oil free um, cobia using this this uh, yeast product. Uh, I mean, just those grains that has, has yeast in it and stuff. So I, I think um, yeah, you get you get the double whammy. You get a a, a, a probiotic effect plus plus a, a protective effect for the gut, uh, and, and and it's a good protein. It was a good protein, but again, I, I think it's still. In the realms of the insect protein prices, you know, not not really feasible to use um, yeah. even now. But but it was it was uh, great great results with shrimp as well. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, um, I'm curious if any uh, the big producers, CP Growbest, Goldcoin, STP, are are you guys using uh, any uh, significant amounts of of yeast products yet or is it still uh, uh, on the way in? I would say on a pro, okay, if you want to go first, Jennifer, go. Okay. Uh, I would say on behalf of Goldcoin, we use uh, yeast. Uh, on the protein side is a good protein. Mm, on the health side, like I mentioned before, I would be more cautious. Um, and in terms of a price, it, yeah, it, it's difficult to fit in a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have one question for the yeast producers. Uh, the yeast is sometimes used to feed the insects uh, as a byproduct. Uh, so can we expect in the future to see a rise in the yeast 
based product protein or would the benefit of the yeast would be transferred to the insect as well as the, the cost? Just a question idea. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that uh, some of our colleagues have done quite a bit of work with black soldier fly and feeding them uh, uh, fish processing waste. And they saw a very quick increase in omega-3 content in, in the insects, in the meal and, and any oil produced from the meal. And that, uh, I mean, as many things, you are what you eat. Uh, the uh, profile of amino acids and fatty acids both started to mesh up more closely with the, uh, uh, in this case, trout that they were feeding them. So I, I wouldn't be surprised with, with uh, yeast that you would start seeing the beta-glucans and other things that, that people like from the yeast. So Jennifer, you were gonna say something as well? Uh, yes, uh, what is the, that's use uh, uh, yeast product in our feet, uh, but uh, the purpose for using that is sometimes we use it to improve the uh, feed uptake. So it's um, it's not a uh, um, it's not a uh, uh, high inclusion rate uh, when we use uh, the yeast product. Okay. Mm. And Erwin, do you have anything to add to that of what uh, STP is doing? Oh, well, basically there are three different uh, kind of uh, yeast, right? Inactive dried yeast, the autolyzed one, and then the hydrolyzed yeast. So we use the hydrolyzed one uh, specific for the functional feed. Uh, we see uh, more benefit on you know uh, incorporating the functional feed uh, as a, one of the you know uh, immune immune enhancer for the uh, specific uh, you know uh, uh, type of the feed. But we don't use the inactive one uh, due to the as already Alex mentioned that cost effective is uh, is not uh, is not you know met in our, in, in our uh, programs so. Still, it's not competitive as compared to the, you know, to the common ingredient like the soybean meal or, uh, you know, uh, processed animal protein. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We, we've run a little bit over our time already. Uh, so uh, I want to thank everybody and uh, special thanks to uh, Locktron for being so kind to my wife and uh, helping take care of her over there. <laughs> which is greatly appreciated till she uh, gets uh, finished with her interview at the embassy and can come on back to the States. So anyways, thank you again for all your informative presentations. Uh, I'd like to mention that our global audience today included over 36,700 people. Uh, so uh, we want to remind everybody to uh, get registered for the F3 Carnivore Edition if you haven't already. Uh, and you can go to f3challenge.org for more details. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us for the seminar today. And please join us for our next webinar on emerging trends in alternative feeds for carnivorous fish, which will be August 19th, 5 a.m. GMT, 1 p.m. Beijing time. And we'd also like to have everybody just take another a minute or two to watch our closing video. Uh, from F3. So thank you. And if Alex would play the final. <laughs>